right, big setup. We are good to go. Welcome, everybody. Um, let's see what we are going to do today. Again, we will recap what we did last time. And since it's uh, been a while since we met, uh, we'll do that in more detail today. And if you remember, what we basically learned last time was how to come up with strategies of how to play infallible opponents in two-player turn-based games. Right? And we saw that that is basically a uh, tree search algorithm. And uh, we indeed actually looked into how to compute strategies. We also saw that uh, that may incur incredible computational burdens because these game trees might be very deep. And so these algorithms we discussed last time might run for quite a while. So therefore today we will look into ways of accelerating these computations. Particularly we look into the notion of alpha beta pruning and the idea of depth restricted searches. Well, and once we're done with that, we actually have learned everything we need to know in order to understand how games like chess or checkers or whatever are um, realized in computer programs these days. How computers uh, are programmed to play chess. So therefore, once we are done with that, we can actually look at the history and the state of the art of um, the idea of using computer programs to play two-player turn-based games. And as usual, we conclude with a summary of what we did today. Now, um, if you remember, last time we had a look into a couple of very crucial concepts, very important ideas. And the first one we discussed was the idea of a zero-sum game. If you remember, we defined it, or it's commonly defined, as a game in which one player's gain or loss of utility is the other player's loss or gain. That is, in a zero-sum game, uh, what you're going to win is exactly balanced by what your opponents are going to lose, or vice versa. And what you're going to lose is balanced by some opponent's gain. And in that definition, there occurs this crucial word, utility, gain or loss of utility. So we looked into the idea of a utility or payoff function and basically defined that to be a way of assigning weights, if you will, to the leaf nodes of a game tree. Say so we were aware of a complete game tree, that is we basically know every possible history a two-player turn-based game can take, um, and we could track these histories or predict these histories until the game would reach an end. So we would reach a leaf node of the tree. If we knew about these leaf nodes, we could actually assign a utility to these leaf nodes. We could say, well, if the game reaches this leaf node, then I, as a player, would gain so and so much, or I would lose so and so much, or this game would actually end in a draw. Um, we said that a gold state in the context of gameplay is a state, a terminal state of these game trees, um, typically a winning state of high payoff for us as the player who is going to make a move. And therefore a gold state is typically a leaf node in the game tree that indicates that in that state we as the moving player would win the game. And once we have agreed that there is something like uh, utilities of terminal nodes and that terminal nodes of high utility could be our goal in a game, we would want to reach such a leaf node in a game tree by making moves subsequently, uh, we can then agree that a strategy is a plan of ours 
as to how to reach such a goal state, as to how to move that by carrying out a sequence of moves where we anticipate what our opponents are going to do, a sequence of moves that would lead us to a goal state, a terminal node in the game tree of high utility. And then we specialize the idea of a strategy towards the concept of an optimal strategy. And there we said that, well, there are of course many possible ways of choosing moves, of moving during a game. And um, well, some of them might actually be very successful in the sense that they will lead us to a winning situation, to a gold state of high utility from our perspective. Some of them may not be as successful and an optimal strategy should be at least as good as any other possible strategy. Oh, and that is basically to say that an optimal strategy is sort of guaranteed to perform well if we choose to follow that strategy. And I have not particularly emphasized it, but a very important concept in all of what we discussed last time was the idea that the opponent we are playing against is supposed to be infallible. That is, in, in all we are doing here, we do assume that the opponent never makes a mistake. Right? This is, uh, of course, a very um, brutal assumption because if you are playing against other humans, uh, that will hardly ever happen that you are playing an infallible opponent. Uh, but if we assume that our opponent is infallible and always moves such that whatever move he or she is doing is actually the best in that situation for him or her, uh, then we can come up with algorithms that would help us to come up with strategies. Excuse me? Yeah. In last lecture, when we were discussing minimums, yeah. we said that okay, if, if they are Mistake, yeah. Better yeah, that's true. Then this oh, um, if you uh, so his question was uh, when we discussed min max last time, then uh, we actually saw that if the opponent does make mistakes, our payoff is likely to be higher than if the opponent was infallible. The uh, thing is that if you think about it, it's very difficult to formalize the search for a strategy under the assumption that the uh, opponent is. Uh, playing at random. With the assumption of an infallible opponent, we can immediately come up with this min-max algorithm. That, that is something we can design if we assume that the player we are playing against never makes a mistake. We can then say, well, whatever I do, my opponent is going to try to counter. And that leads to this algorithm we discussed last time. It's very difficult to come up with a simple algorithm like that if we, if we do not make such an assumption. However, we, as you said, saw that, well, let us assume that was the algorithm we used to come up with the strategy. Then, if the opponent doesn't, uh, does not play infallible, it's even better for us. Right? But this assumption helped us to formalize the way as to how we would find or compute our strategy. All right. And um, again, uh, let me, let me brief you, uh, briefly remind you uh, of the terminology we used. So uh, I said that uh, for our discussion, we'll uh, have two names for the players involved in this two-player turn-based uh, non-zero-sum zero game, uh, namely uh, Max and Min, where I was using the name Max to always refer to that player who is going to move. Because Max, when making a move, or when, when faced with deciding what kind of move to make, will try to come up with a move that will very likely maximize his or her payoff later on. And then when Max has moved, Min, the opponent, will try to move such that the payoff for Max will be minimized. Always try to, to counter what Max is doing. Yeah. And again, uh, I will refer to arbitrary game states uh, using the letter N, just some variable number, uh, name. 
And um, I also, again, may use the, uh, the terms game tree and search tree, or game tree stage and, and, and game tree node, game state and game tree node interchangeably, as I will probably use the terms game tree and search tree. Right? Because we already saw that we can think of the problem of looking for a strategy, of, of coming up with a strategy, finding a strategy is tantamount to searching a particular path in a tree. And here is the min-max algorithm we uh, thought about last time. Again, remember, yeah, sort of coming back to your question, uh, this is a way for deciding moves when playing an infallible opponent. This is a decision rule that would help us to come up with, given the current game state, come up with moves, actions, that would take us to subsequent game state from which it is rather likely that we may end up in a terminal state of high payoff. And um, if we assume that our opponent is infallible, then we should try, and we know that, that our opponent would always try to, to have us lose, and always try to have us lose as badly as possible. Well, that is you know, what infallible opponents do. And so we should try to come up with a move that either minimizes our maximum loss or maximizes our minimum gain. Right? And we discussed that, that uh, this idea of trying to minimize maximum loss or maximize minimum gain does not at all guarantee that we will make it big if we win. Right? This is not trying to maximize our possible gain. But this is trying to you know, be sort of modest and be um, happy with sort of a small gain, but as we you know, try to be happy with, with even small gains, at the same time really try to, to win it all. And um, well, yeah, then we, we discussed uh, how we could formalize that and saw that indeed uh, this idea can be cast as a very simple recursive algorithm which basically computes a min-max value for every node in the tree. And uh, it proceeds as follows. So we are in a certain state n. Right? We want to compute the min-max value as the moving player, as max. The min-max value for that game state. Now, if that game state is already a terminal node, we immediately know, OK, in this state, our payoff will be this and that. We can immediately assign the min max value as the utility in state n uh, to, this, to this value mm, mmv if m is a terminal state. Now, if m n is not a terminal state, then why would we say, okay, so uh, max is about to move and there will be a couple of successor nodes for node n. And um, we will have to compute the min-max value of all these successor nodes and then pick uh, the maximum value out of these. Right? And that would then be the min-max value for the state we are in. And of course, in the next, uh, like once we are going to move, we would actually move to that successor node of the state we are in for which our min-max value is highest. Now, once sort of we have moved, our opponent, Min, will try to counter our move and will try to minimize what we can gain. So in the successor state we reach from here, from the current state we're in, N, uh, we will move as max to the successor state with the highest uh, min-max value for us. And in that state, well, min is to move. And again, that state will also have successors. And min will try to determine a successor of minimum payoff for max. Right? So it is basically, um, 
interchanging computation. We start at some node somewhere in the tree and then have to recursively progress down the tree towards the level of the leaves. And interchangeably, we'll have to compute a maxima for every state that would indicate a state where max is to move and minima for every state where min is to move. Yeah, and uh, we saw that this is indeed easily possible. Here is a more, one of the more complex examples I showed you last time. Um, this is actually a tree of five levels where Max is looking ahead one, two, three, four moves, okay, trying to, to decide for what to do in state and not by looking ahead. So what would happen in the next uh, state of the game and what would happen in the state after that and what would happen in the state after that. And it's looking ahead a couple of moves. We see that, uh, again, this tree uh, you know, broadens fairly quickly, even in, in this simple example where the branching factor is just two as you can see. Um, and therefore, if you think about uh, what this recursive formula actually does, you realize it is a depth-first search algorithm, tree search algorithm, where uh, in a knot we have to think about, as player max, about the min-max values of nodes n1 and n2. Right? Now, we uh, want to compute the min-max value for node n1. We don't know it yet, so we have to consider the successor states of n1. That would lead us to n3 and n4, whose min-max values, again, we don't know yet, and we don't have any way of computing them, so we have to expand these uh, successor states as well, leading us to four more successor states. And if we expand those, we have reached the leaf level of this tree for which we could compute the min-max values immediately, just, you know, use the utility uh, values assigned to these leaves. Now, once we have them, uh, say 12 and 9 in this example, we know that player min would go for the state that minimizes his or her pay, uh, maximum loss, and that is to say uh, the minimum of 12 and 9 is, of course, 9. So in this state, player min would definitely decide for the successor state with a payoff of 9. In this state, the possible payoffs for player max, the subsequent uh, states of the game, are 18 and 13, the minimum of which is 13. So we have found that in this level of the tree, uh, min either go for 9 or 13. Since these are two successor states of a game state or a <coughs> node in the tree that indicates a move of player max. We know that max is now trying to maximize the minimum gain of these two nodes and when faced with choosing payoff of 9 or 13, max would go for 13. Right? We can again propagate that up one level of the tree and then we have to go down one level of the tree. We can propagate that, go down, go down. This is a depth first search algorithm. And the effort for computing that can explode quite quickly. Right? Indeed, in the worst case, and, and, and here we are not you know, looking at, at a particular gold state, so we actually have to compute it for the whole tree. The effort is of the order of B, the branching factor, raised to the power of M, the maximum depth of the tree. And that is to say that this simple implementation or simple formulation of the min-max algorithm, of the algorithm that computes min-max values for every node and thus helps us to decide where to move next, this is usually infeasible to compute. You can compute that for tic-tac-toe. You can use brute force there and indeed compute the complete game tree, compute the min-max value for every node in the game tree, you may even be able to do that for Connect4, but most certainly not in checkers and in chess. I would say nobody has computed the complete game tree as of now. Very unlikely that it will happen anytime soon. Uh, and for Go, we can basically abandon all hope. No, it's true. It's, uh, <laughs> 
Uh, this, this, I mean, look at it. This is a tree of uh, maximum depth. Uh, four here, because I'm, I'm counting the, the root node level as level uh, zero. And the branching factor is two, and still we have so many leaf nodes already. These trees, you know, grow very, very quickly. And um, you do not have to store, while computing these min-max, well, you do not have to store every node we have ever visited. Right? But still, we have to visit them all. So even though the memory complexity might be OK, the runtime complexity is not. It's just not. Yeah, and then, um, so this, this is sort of, this is what we saw last time. Uh, are there any more questions to that, about that? Right, because if not, we can try to think what gives. What can we do about this problem? About the problem that this uh, simple and easy to understand algorithm that would help us coming up with a strategy for playing an infallible opponent is not really computable. It's not feasible uh, for, for real applications. What gives? What can we do? Now, um, an obvious idea results from remembering what we discussed uh, prior to the last lecture. Namely the fact that if we expand these game trees, or if we, first of all, decide for representing all possible games in terms of branches of the game tree. Right? We discussed that there might be other representations and you know, they might be more memory efficient. But if we decide for this representation of all possible games in terms of a tree, uh, we'll have to face the problem or issue that several of the nodes we might expand during our search for a strategy occur more than once. That, once again, is to say that uh, during a game there may be game states that can result from different histories of moves. Right? Different ways of placing the pieces on a uh, tic-tac-toe board or chessboard, whatever, um, might after a couple of moves result in exactly the same game state. And uh, well then, um, we also remember that it may be possible for us to compute mm, hash values for game states. Right? So that once you know we uh, observe a game state or once we have expanded a new node in this game tree, um, we might compute a say numerical value to represent that game state and this is great because these numerical values could be used as keys in lookup tables. And uh, that of course leads to this obvious idea of creating such lookup tables. And in the context of uh, gameplay or AI for games, these lookup tables are often referred to as transposition tables. But once again, just to say uh, a hash table or a lookup table where um, the key is a number we have computed for a game state and uh, the argument would be the game state or probably more information as to what follows from that game state or possibly also the min-max value of that game state. Now, why would that be useful? Uh, well, think of it like this. If the min-max algorithm is happily expanding the game tree one node at a time in a depth-first manner, and so we start from some root node and progress down some branch of that tree and then propagate everything we have found back up and then have to propagate down another branch of the tree, it may happen that in this new branch we encounter a state we have seen before. Once our algorithm could realize that, we could stop expanding the tree again because 
if we encounter a state we have seen before in another branch of the tree, well then we have already computed, say, the min-max value for that state and we don't have to do it again. Yeah? I think this is called dynamic programming in, in programming approach where you just cache all your results and just review them. There are many different, so in, in different areas, so his question was like, isn't that dynamic programming? Uh, my answer to that would be yes, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself an expert in dynamic programming, but what I can tell you is that in different areas of computer science, different concepts have different names. And I just said, you know, here these things are called transposition tables. Okay. This is, yeah, whatever. Another question? No. Um, yeah, so this, this, is, this, is, this is a good idea. This is a good idea. And this is indeed done in practice. This is indeed done. There, there wouldn't be any chess programs without this idea of sort of recycling min-max values uh, you have computed earlier on during a search. Um, great. Now, uh, this is an obvious idea. Uh, and we could ask, are there more, further, maybe less obvious ideas? And it turns out, uh, yes, there are less obvious ideas. And that is what we're going to study today. And we start with this observation. It is often possible, or I claim, it's, it's an observation, but, but from your point of view, at this point in time, it's a claim of, of mine. I claim that there are situations during the computation of min-max values in this depth-first manner where we can come up with a correct decision as to what the min-max value will be for a certain node without having to explore that node in full. Hmm. And in this case, or, or if we sort of can think of a way as to how that can be done, we could then show that we can reduce the effort of min-max computation from O of B raised to the power of M to B raised to M over 2. So this is, uh, does not sound much, but it's dramatic. It's like in terms of, you know, overall efforts, uh, halving the exponent is, is a great accomplishment. How is that done? Well, there is this idea of pruning. And in the context of game AI, or AI in general, this, this term pruning is used to refer to the idea of eliminating uh, possible successor states in a tree search from consideration without having to you know, really examine them. And this sounds like magic for those of you who have not seen that before, so let's look into an example. This is again best understood by means of an example. Now, in a nutshell, what will happen now is basically min-max computation, but we introduce two variables uh, which are traditionally called alpha and beta and these variables are meant to indicate the in the case of alpha highest min max value found for player max the one who is to move in this situation and uh, beta is used to sort of uh, keep track of the lowest min max value for player min and when we start the um, min-max computation of a tree like that, using alpha-beta pruning, which we'll do in a second, we initialize alpha, something that should be large, to minus infinity, and beta, something that should be small, to plus infinity. Right? Because you know, it's always easy to minimize plus infinity something and maximize minus infinity something. So this is, this is the initialization of alpha and beta. Now, we are faced with the problem of computing the min-max value for n0 
um, which is to say that we have to compute the bin max value for the three successor states in this example. And that is to say we have to progress with our search down one level of the tree. Um, well, yeah, so now we will have to consider the computation of the <coughs> min max value for node n1. This is a node where player min is to move. Um, yeah, since we have not seen any actual uh, alpha or beta yet, we have not reached the leaf level of the, uh, the, the, the tree. Uh, basically have propagated these two values, minus infinity and plus infinity, down one level of the tree. In order to compute the min-max value of this state, we of course have to <coughs> determine the min-max values of the three successor states, which is easy because they are lead nodes. We just look up their utilities. We find that node N4 has a utility of 3. Uh, node N6 has a utility of 12. Note that this is somehow random already. I'm not sort of expanding them from left to right necessarily. Um, this is you know, a random selection of successor nodes. But this one has a payoff of 3, this one has a payoff of 12, the next one has a payoff of 8. Uh, but this is to say that from the point of view of player min, um, this state should be the one to move to because this has the lowest, uh, lowest sort of loss value for player min. Right? Again, when facing with having to pay 3, 8 or 12 dollars, an infallible opponent would choose to just pay three dollars. Um, now, once we have expanded these three nodes, which, you know, just look up their utilities, we can indeed say that the lowest min-max value found so far is three, and we can set better to three. And now, different sources do it differently. I chose to also uh, set alpha here, so basically, once we have seen these three nodes, we can say that, okay, beta, the lowest min-max value for min, is 3 now. And at the same time, alpha, the highest min-max value found for max, is 3. Because if you know, min goes for 3 here, then this branch of the tree will yield a payoff of 3 for max. And we can propagate this information up one level of the tree. <coughs> right. The fact, we, from the perspective of the root node of this example, we now know that this, say, left branch here will, from the perspective of max, yield a payoff of 3. We don't know what's going on in the other branches of the tree yet, so we don't know the better value. Now, we have to continue to explore this tree in order to compute these min-max values. And so we propagate this information down one level to node N2. And from there, uh, we have to expand the successor nodes. And uh, lo and behold, we expand node N9 first in this example. And this node has a utility of 2. What does that mean? It means that player max, by expanding this branch of the tree first, has realized that if he or she would make a move towards this successor state, the minimum, the, the minimum maximum payoff would be 3. And now, in this branch of the tree, we, by progressing down to the leaf level, have found a node with a payoff of 2, and this is less than 3. Right. And uh, that is to say, now, player min knows, basically, uh, player max, while computing these min max values, knows that, okay, from what I have seen so far, my best payoff would be 3, and now I have 
reached a situation where the payoff in this leaf would be two, which is to say that my opponent would definitely go for that payoff. Well, this is two, that is less than three, and so um, therefore there might be higher values here, say 250 and 50 million, but player two will like, you know, there might also be one of, of one or minus, minus 20. But this is, is not important from the perspective of player max, because player max now already knows that by having found this two, that this branch will lead to a lower payoff than this branch. Because if these were to yield higher payoffs, player min wouldn't choose them. Player min would go for two. If they would yield even lower payoffs, player min would choose them. But in either case, Max does not have to care about these anymore. Because just by looking at that two, which is less than the three he or she can expect so far, it's, it's obvious that whatever is to follow here, and I could go down levels and levels and levels, would not be better than what has been found here. So it does not have to be expanded anymore. Uh, we can um, use this information. Um, note that from the perspective of the root node, it's still not clear what the, um, the best value for beta will be. So it's still <coughs> at plus infinity. And in the final branch of the tree, we still know that the best payoff so far that Max can expect is three. So we have to expand the uh, subsequent nodes uh, following node and three. We find a 14. And that is to say immediately this plus infinity uh, best thing for, for player min to do in this situation, uh, drops from plus infinity to 14. And now um, we find a 2, which is again less than 3. And so max, while computing all these min-max values by looking ahead down the tree, does not have to worry about any other, other branches of that subtree because, again, max knows that for this branch, Regardless of what is to follow here, it might be something more than two or something less than two. The whole branch here is not as good for max as this branch. Okay. And there you have it. So um, we could compute uh, a valid, it's not necessarily like, uh, you know, the, the it's a valid min-max value. Right? We, we did not have to look up what's going on, like, you know, down in every, every leaf node of this tree. Uh, and of course, if that tree would be, you know, of considerably larger depth, and we would have, you know, found something in this branch, and then something in this We do not necessarily have to expand all the branches to the end. If in one of the branches, like, one of the three top branches here of this tree, we realize that this one will lead to a situation that is worse than the situation in this branch. Yeah, that is alpha beta proning. And um, right here is why, why it works, um, or like more formally why it works. From the perspective of uh, player max, who is to move in the root node of this tree, the problem is to maximize a set of three values. There are three successor states, so we have to sort of look for the uh, successor state with the maximum payoff. And um, well, these three successor states um, contain min max values that are computed in this simple example as the minimum of 12, 3, and 8 and the minimum of 2 and something, we don't know, and the minimum of 14, 2 and something, we don't know. Right. And of course, the minimum of this set is 3, so we have to compute the maximum of 3 
and the minimum of this set and the minimum of that set. We can definitely say that the minimum of 14, 2 and V is the minimum of 2 and V. Regardless what V is, 14 is larger than 2. We don't really have to worry about 14 here. And again, in this situation, um, the minimum of 2x and y, 2 and something we don't know, what is the minimum of 2x and y? Um, and so basically we are faced with computing the maximum over three numbers. First one here, second one has not been computed yet, third one has not been computed yet. But we can abstractly think of this as computing the maximum of three numbers, 3, z, and w, where we know that z and w will be less or equal than 2. Right. Again, uh, this v, which is the utility of this node, which we have not actually looked up, can be something very large. It doesn't matter. If it is something large, then the minimum of 2 and v is 2. If it is something very negative, like a situation that is very good for player min, say minus 20, then the minimum of 2 and minus 20 would be minus 20. But from the perspective of max, that is something to avoid. So yeah, that, that is why it works. And um, therefore, we can come up with min-max decisions without having to compute every uh, to compute min max size for every node in the tree if we keep track of what we have found so far. Well, yeah, and of course, uh, this maximum uh, expected payoff here for max would then be 3. Um, here is how you could compute that, and note that I have switched to pseudocode notation, not Python. Um, this is basically just a variant of the implementation of the min-max algorithm. All right. <coughs> um, if we are faced with computing the min-val of uh, one of these nodes in, in a level of the tree where player min is to move, well, we first have to check if the current node is a terminal state, because if it is a terminal state, we just propagate back the utility value. Well, if it is not a minimum uh, terminal state, then we have to consider all successor nodes. And this, this is, if you, if you look at it, it's just like the computation of the min-max value from last time, but I have replaced MMV by beta. Right. So instead of uh, using the variable MMV here, I'm using beta. And that is to say that uh, player min, the one which is computing min values, is updating beta. And um, if one of these updates leads to the realization that, ah, uh, I have now found a min max value, beta called, uh, which is called beta in this case, that is less than the min max value for my opponent, which in this case here is 3, again coming from this subtree, max would for now go here because you know 3 is a good payoff. Uh, 2 is less than uh, 3, um, well, then we can return that information. We don't have to worry about further successor states anymore. And um, this, this is how this uh, function maxval from last time would have to be modified. Here, uh, the goal is to maximize uh, these min max values. I have replaced the variable MMV with alphas here. If we find an alpha that is larger than the current estimate of beta, we know this will be a branch in the search tree where player min will never descend to. So we can basically prune that branch, do not have to worry about it anymore. And again, this is how um, this algorithm would be called. Uh, remember that we look at all of this from the perspective of player max, so we have to call max val starting with the root node and initialize alpha to minus infinity and beta to plus infinity. There you have it. That's that. Um, remember that when we expanded uh, these three successors of node and one, I pointed out that I did so in a random fashion. Right. 
And uh, it is obvious that the efficiency of alpha beta pruning depends on the order of states in which uh, they are expanded, or successive states are expanded. Right? Because, uh, say, if in, in this example, in the last branch we looked at, the successor node with a 2 would have been found first, then, uh, you know, same as here, we would not have had to expand this node. Um, but in this example, I somehow realized the algorithm such that this node was expanded first, which gave a utility of 14, which is larger than, than 3, uh, and then we found a utility of 2 and could stop expanding so the final leaf node there. Again, if we would have found this successor state with a payoff of 2 first, we would not even have had to expand the state to 14. And uh, yeah, so uh, therefore, uh, this can still go wrong uh, in the sense that if everything is really like sort of working against us and the leaf nodes are expanded in an order that is, you know, really sorted from largest to lowest, uh, we don't gain anything. However, one can show that if these successors are expanded in a random fashion, randomly ordered fashion, the number of nodes that this modified min-max algorithm would have to explore or examine is of the order of b raised to 3 quarters m. This is much better than b raised to the m. And I'm putting this one can show in quotation marks because I will not show it to you. But you could prove that. This, this, is, this can be proven uh, using mathematical rigor. We could come up with a theorem. We could prove that theorem. If this was a uh, hardcore and plain AI lecture, uh, we would do that. But this is a lecture on game AI, and, and these are details that are not so very interesting better that you see these things, but we don't have to worry about every technical detail of these classical, classical ideas. So therefore, one can show that, I will not. Um, again, effort of uh, order of magnitude b raised to the power of 3 over 4 times n is better than <coughs> effort of uh, b raised to the m. The question is, uh, can we do better still? And um, that leads us to the question, well, okay, uh, it depends on the order, right? With sort of random ordering, we can do better than O raised to the, uh, than O of B raised to the M. So what if the successor states of a node we are currently examining were ordered so that the best alternative <coughs> is expanded, for, expanded first. And this is of course impossible. Why is that? Well, uh, my guess would be anyway we should have more information in order to judge whether it was the best alternative or not, right? Yeah. So we should think do some computations anyway. Yeah. So if our like successors of the first node would be like, I don't know, instead of three thousands, mm -hmm. then we should do thousand computations and mm -hmm. just to compare that it was the best. Mm -hmm. Then for the second uh, child of the loop node, yes we can already judge that mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. this is the best if this was the best. But for, for the first one mm -hmm. we should calculate all of them. So if I may paraphrase that, you, you suggest something like uh, a breadth first search, not a depth first search, but uh, what is called breadth first. That is instead of expanding. Uh, I'm not suggesting anything, I'm just trying to answer the okay, question. Okay, okay. Are there any other ideas why, I mean, this is a hypothetical question, what if we could, you know, order the successor states of the one we are currently examining in 
uh, a manner that the best alternative from the perspective of theta max or min, depending on what level we are, is uh, listed first so that we would uh, examine that one first and so that we could quickly come up with a pruning decision. Uh, that is the what if question. What if that was possible? And now I'm saying it is not possible. Why not? Exactly, exactly. So his, no, no, his, 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 you know, his answer is that, uh, you know, we would have to compare these things. But in the uh, algorithm we have, algorithms we have looked in so far, in order to actually compare nodes, we so far had to proceed down to the leaf level of the tree anyway. Uh, I mean, once we would do that, so we are in some node, we have to expand a couple of successors, we want to compare them, we basically have to go down to the leaf level of the tree, and then we can order them. Because then we have all the information necessary to order them. Uh, but if we do that, well then this does not you know, yield anything. Because we actually, this is what we try to avoid. This is what we want to avoid, that we have to go down to the leaf level of the tree. So this, this is indeed, very strictly speaking, not possible. Not possible. But let us, for the time being, assume it was. Right? In that case, one can show, again, in quotation marks, I will not do it. We could. We could, but uh, let's you know, uh, ignore these, these technical details for the sake of the main theme of this lecture. If it was possible for us to order the successor states according to their quality from the perspective of the player who is going to move, uh, we could show that that would reduce the complexity down to uh, b to the power of m over 2. But this is great. This is great. Um, because, um, yeah, this is somehow like obvious, but b raised to uh, 1 over 2 times m is the same as square root of b raised to the power of m. And that is to say that with alpha beta pruning under this assumption that that was possible in the best possible case in the best possible case the effective branching factor of the tree would go down from b to square root of b so that's basically to say these trees would not you know explode as quickly anymore but you know not as quickly it's good that is good and also uh, obviously again uh, m is 2 times 1 over 2 times m. And it's basically to say that uh, with alpha beta pruning under the best possible circumstances, we can do these lookup computations twice as far ahead as usual min max search in the same amount of time. So that, um, yeah, that would be really cool if we could guarantee that. Strictly speaking, we cannot because in order to order nodes to be expanded according to quality, yeah. we need more information. And so far this information just becomes available to us from you know, progressing down to the bottom layer of the tree. This is what I just said. Right? That uh, even, even if we use alpha beta pruning, uh, we still do have, at least for some branches, some we can prune away quickly, uh, but for many branches typically we still have to go all the way down to the leaf level of the tree. And again, if this B is large and this M is large, then this is still not feasible. Uh, this is definitely feasible for games such as tic-tac-toe. Uh, there, you know, if you use alpha beta, it's like you, you can you can use the original min max algorithm there, but if you use alpha beta, it's even <coughs> better, even better. Uh, but this is still not feasible for games like chess. 
And of course, chess is what humankind sort of started out with when developing all these techniques because it was thought that once we have a computer program that can play chess well, can beat the reigning world champion, like once we have that, we have solved the problem of artificial intelligence. So that was a, uh, a stumbling stone for chess programs. And the question is, of course, yeah, what to do about it? What to do about this still fundamental problem that we cannot really avoid, even with pruning? And uh, yeah, the grandfathers, founding fathers of these, the, the early geniuses of, of computer science, uh, of course, immediately saw what was to be done. In this 1950 paper by Shannon, where he you know, was fathoming the possibilities of uh, writing programs to play chess, he immediately uh, came up with this idea of tree searches for doing that, based on work by Wiener earlier, whatever, came up with the idea to cut off searches. Uh, not to go down towards level of the leaves but you know to cut these searches at some earlier point in order to do that um, yeah now now if we were to do that you know, trying to expand the search tree wanting to compute min max values but you know don't reach the leaf level anymore then we don't have access to these utility values and therefore we need something to replace the computation of utility values and this is called uh, heuristic evaluation functions. So we need, we need some, some informed guess uh, as to what to do in the higher levels of a tree if we cut the search there. And a heuristic slash evaluation, I, I again may use these two terms interchangeably, don't be surprised, uh, provides an estimate of the utility of a game state even if we have not you know, computed the utility of leaf nodes and then propagated back up, these heuristics provide us with estimates of utilities of nodes and if we can uh, reliably estimate them, then of course we can cut searches at certain points without having to go down all the way to the terminal states. If we uh, would agree on doing this, then the computation of the min-max uh, values and thus the computation of the alpha-beta pruning values would have to change from this to this. So we can compute min, it's not true min-max values anymore, but let's call them like that anyway, uh, by cutting searches at some higher level in the tree, not at the leaf node level anymore, um, then we would have to replace the computation of true utility values and leaf nodes by the computation of this evaluation function. And of course this evaluation function would have to be called not if n is a terminal state, but if our cutoff criterion is met. However we define that, if we have a function that would give us a cutoff, for instance, could be after 10 levels. If we don't, one level, two levels, three levels, four levels. Once we, once we have reached like 10 levels of look ahead, we just stop searching. It could be as simple as that. Once this test yields true, we would then have to evaluate state n rather than actually to look up a utility value. Everything <coughs> else remains unchanged. Um, and to make, to make these ideas more clear, we'll look at another example. And finally, back to tic-tac-toe. Uh, and for some reason, I have a generous, a bit generous with tease for tic-tac-toe here. But anyway, um, here is an evaluation function for tic-tac-toe. The idea is to say that, um, so we want to evaluate a state n during the course of a game of tic-tac-toe in which player P is to move. Right. What, what, is, what is sort of uh, the, yeah, utility, we can't call it utility, but what is the evaluation of that state? Uh, here's an idea, we simply compute the number of lines on the tic-tac-toe board uh, 
that are still available for player P to win and subtract the number of lines where the opponent can win. Um, so here is, is an example. N refers to the game state and uh, eval N of X gives us the evaluation the, the, the value of the evaluation function for player cross and this uh, eval n naught gives us the evaluation for player naught. So in this uh, state of the game, the very initial state, uh, we compute the number of lines on this board where player cross can win. That is one vertical line, two vertical lines, three vertical lines, one horizontal line, two horizontal lines, three horizontal lines, one diagonal and one anti-diagonal. So if no uh, mark has been placed yet, on this board there are basically eight possibilities for player cross to come up with three consecutive crosses. But the same holds true for player naught, and therefore if we subtract these two numbers as proposed there, we'll see that the evaluated utility of that state for player cross is zero as it is for player naught. Now, uh, this is a state where player cross has, has uh, marked one field. You can then of course ask the question, now what happens for player naught? Um, how many lines are, are there left for player naught to win this game? There is like one vertical, two verticals, one horizontal, two horizontals. The diagonals are gone. Right? Player, player not cannot win using the diagonals anymore because that has been occupied already by player cross. So there is four possibilities for player not to win. And in this state there are still eight possibilities for player cross to win. If we subtract these two numbers, we end up with minus four player naught, that would be the evaluation of that state from the point of view of player naught. Yeah, minus four uh, seems like hopeless, but we have seen last time that there is no reason for player naught to abandon all hope because this will always end in a draw. Uh, however, from the perspective of player cross, this is really great because uh, there's basically eight ways of winning this game from the perspective of cross, while there's just four winning this game from the perspective of naught, so 8 minus 4 is 4. Here is a situation where naught has moved, now it's a uh, crosses move again, how many, how many possibilities are there? One vertical, two vertical, one horizontal, two horizontal and one diagonal is five possibilities for cross still to win, whereas for naught there is just like again one horizontal, one vertical, another horizontal, another vertical, four. Uh, 5 minus 4, uh, minus 4 is 1. And, you know, here we have a situation where there's like two marks by cross and you get the picture. So this is uh, a function that assigns numerical values to these states uh, and we can compute it from the perspective of either player. And here is um, how I did that in Python. Just you know, to, to provide you with ideas, um, I call this function evaluate game state. It depends on the current state S and the player P who is to move. Uh, what I'm doing here is I uh, create a copy of the current game state, I call that copy T1, and then using this expression we met earlier on, T1 of in uh, square brackets T1 equal equal zero, uh, I set that to p. This is, this is another powerful feature of um, NumPy. Basically, if you remember, this uh, t1 of t1 equals something yields all the elements in t1, which is a copy of the state, uh, that are zero in this case. And I set them all to p. So basically, this replaces every zero in this copy of the state with a value of p. If p is player cross, uh, then, then that would be plus one. If it's, it's the other player, then it's uh, minus one. Actually, we do that here. We create another copy of the current game state, and there we replace every zero with a value of minus p. 
In both cases, we compute the number of winning lines for these sort of two copies and return the difference from the perspective of the uh, player P in the argument. So if P is minus one, then of course that would be a minus one and that would be a one. And if P in the argument is plus one, then that would be a plus one and that would be a minus one. So that's, you know. Now how do we compute the number of winning lines? This is a sort of straightforward extension from what we looked in last time or a couple of lectures ago. Basically, we compute now in this in this boards where we have replaced every zero with a one or a minus one, we compute the uh, column sums, the row sums, we compute um, the size of uh, basically the, the, the number of uh, columns where columns sum to three, the number of columns, uh, rows where the rows sum to three, uh, then we compute the sum of the diagonal, and we use this times p trick again, and we compute the sum of the anti-diagonal, and that gives us three things we have to sum. This is basically the number of columns in which p can win, the number of rows in which p can win, the question of whether or not p can win along the diagonal, and the question of p can win along the anti-diagonal, and we return that, that's it. That's it, this is a straightforward extension of this test of uh, whether or not a state has been a winning state. So here, there you go. And if need be, you could now immediately extend this to connect four. Uh, is this a good evaluation function? Right, after all, I you know, just sort of made it up. Where does it come from? Um, let's see. Here we have uh, five states, uh, or five, five possible states. Uh, player cross is about to evaluate these five states. There are uh, basically five fields left. Let's assume this, this has been uh, achieved so far, two crosses, two noughts, and now uh, player cross is evaluating what happens if I put a cross here, what happens if I put a cross there, cross there, cross there. Uh, which, of these, which of these states is the one that cross has to go for in this case? The second one? No. no. Well, it, it, like if not, is it? Pardon? The second or the last? Uh, the last one is the best choice so far. Um, because consider that if not plays unfailably and, and cross puts a cross somewhere here, there, 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 whatever, not will win. So indeed, the only possible thing for player cross to do in this situation is the fifth alternative. Everything else will lead to a loss immediately. Doesn't it matter whether it is in, in all these states not to play? It's, it's his turn actually, not the cross turn. No, no, no. We, we assume, yeah, this, this, these are explorations of cross. Um, so, so we assume that this has been placed, this has been placed, this has been placed, this has been placed. Now there is five possibilities for cross to move, and, and these are the five possibilities. Right. And just from looking at we know that cross has to move here, because if not, he or she will lose immediately. Right. Would that be reflected by our evaluation function? Uh, to make a long story short, yes, it would. This is, well, it could be a happy coincidence. Right. Then indeed, um, among these five alternatives, the last one gives the highest value for the evaluation function and therefore sort of the one that cross should decide for. Uh, looks like a happy alternative uh, coincident, but it's not. It's because we subtract what will happen for player cross uh, and what will happen for player not. And because of this subtraction, this indeed works, works, works very well, very well. Uh, and still, in a sense, it's a lucky coincidence. Right? Like for chess, it wouldn't be that easy. Okay, um, yeah, well, okay, so then how, how would we define these evaluation functions? In a nutshell, I don't know. I can't really tell you. I, there, there's no answer to that, um, except for these guidelines. It shouldn't take too long, obviously. If it takes longer to compute, 
the evaluation function then to expand the tree, we don't gain anything. Should be something fast. Uh, it should preserve the order uh, of the sort of utility values in leaf nodes. Right? So that should be uh, preserved and, and the evaluation should reflect that. And uh, yeah, it should be correlated with the chance of winning. Right? So if, if uh, a state would actually in the end lead to a win, but the evaluation function would predict the opposite, then it's not a good evaluation function. But these are you know, extremely rough guidelines and I'm actually very sorry that I can't make it more precise than that. Um, yeah, if we use these cutoffs, um, we, we now saw that it is possible to come up with the evaluation function that would allow us to cut off the search at earlier stages, but then we have to be aware of the fact that uh, we are now uncertain as to the true min-max value of a node. And uh, they might be overly optimistic, so this example above is indeed a very crude heuristic, but it works well for tic-tac-toe. And um, here is how it is, is done in practice. So typically, uh, we think of a certain game state, which we want to evaluate, as something whose quality we can measure in terms of different measures. These measures are called features. For those of you who have been with me in a pattern recognition lecture, you know the notion of features. And um, yeah, we just saw that a feature uh, could be the number of willing lines uh, for one player on a board of tic-tac-toe, and another feature would be the number of willing lines for the other feature, uh, player. Right? In chess, uh, there are typically material values for pieces on the boards and values for positions on the board, whatever. They are features. Uh, we can compute several features for every state. Maybe one is sufficient, typically it's not. We need to compute abstract characteristics or characterizations of, of these game states. And let's say we compute M of them. Uh, M is unfortunately has nothing to do with the depth of the tree. I should have used another variable here. Uh, we compute a couple of features for every state. Uh, we can collect them in a feature vector. Right. Once we have feature vectors, we are in the realm of statistical pattern recognition because now we can group or cluster them. We can run clustering algorithms to cluster feature vectors and that provides us with categories uh, or clusters of, of feature vectors which correspond to groups of game states. Right. Different game states may look differently but with respect to their features they are very similar. Right. But we can therefore cluster them, let's call these categories C. If we're uh, in a certain game state N, we want to evaluate it, we first realize this game state N belongs to category C. And then, uh, once we have obtained these categories, however we did that, clustering or um, sitting down and thinking about it, um, we can then use experience or again statistics to assign or to estimate how likely a certain category will lead to a win later on. Right? So that is basically that we replace the computation of utility values on the leaf node level with the uh, computation of uh, utilities plus one minus one zero for categories. That can then be used to compute uh, expected values for winning so, for instance, we could evaluate a node n with some probability of winning times uh, this is actually this is something wrong here. I'll fix that. But we can. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'll fix that next time. Uh, we can compute the probability of winning for a certain state using very simple expectation values. We have to make sure that these are. Uh, probabilities of winning, losing, and uh, ending in a draw, sum to one. These can be estimated from lots of lots of games. You actually did that with tic-tac-toe. Um, Try to do that already. And you can also use experience and, and you know, use your, your uh, brain to think about how likely will this lead to a win. Uh, another opportunity or possibility is to compute more abstract 
uh, sort of second order features or characteristics from these uh, features you compute for every state. For instance, in chess, I already mentioned it, there are these material values, a pawn has a value of one, knight of three, queen of nine, and so on and so forth. Uh, abstract features such as king safety are usually measured in pawns, I don't know, half a pawn or something like that. And uh, once you have computed many such features, again, M has nothing to do with the depth of the tree, uh, you can linearly combine them, where these weights here in this, in this linear combination are again set according to experience, and uh, lots of experience is, is necessary to play chess or uh, come up with chess programs. But these are ways of how to compute evaluation functions. Sort of more abstract ways that uh, abstract away uh, the information we had about tic-tac-toe when I said let's compute the number of winning lines and subtract them. That was a lot of domain knowledge going into that evaluation function. With approaches like that, you still need domain knowledge to come up with good features and to come up with good weights, but then you know, so just sum them. Um, and here's the kicker. If we have good evaluation functions, we can of course use them to rank successor nodes. And then we can efficiently prune. Right? Now, now we do not have to go down to the level of the leaves of the game tree anymore, but we have, we assume, a good evaluation function and that allows us to rank uh, successor nodes according to quality and then we can prune the ones that are not so interesting to us. So allows for more efficient alpha beta pruning. And that would also allow us to realize best first search algorithms, but we will talk about that later on. Try to speed up a bit so to stay in time. Um, okay, uh, ever so briefly. So far, we just talked about deterministic two-player turn-based games. What if there are elements of chance in there, as in backgammon? We have to roll. Yeah? I think there is no need to calculate that really in such depth because the, the chance just helps to scramble the things. Well, so, yeah, he, he, um, he suggested not to compute the depth, uh, the tree to its full depth because of chance ruining everything. Um, Rest assured, you can do it. <laughs> and here's how. Um, you introduce a new type of nodes. So far we had like two types of nodes. The nodes where max is to move and the nodes where min is to move. And now we introduce a third type and they are called chance nodes. And uh, we introduce them after every max node and after every min node. And in these chance nodes we register the probability of random events, such as, for instance, in the case of Begemmen, uh, the random outcome or the, the outcome of the random event of rolling two dice. Right? In that um, terminology of probability theory, the random variable called x is the sum of two dice. It's a random variable because whenever we roll two dice, its value will be different. Uh, some values are more likely than others. And therefore, the outcomes, or like if we observe several, several instantiations of this random variable, we will realize that certain instantiations occur more frequently. For instance, if we are interested in what is the relative frequency of an outcome of 12, so the sum of two dice is supposed to be 12, uh, what do we have to compute? The probability of that event would be the probability of observing two sixes. That's the only way of how two dice can produce a value of 12. And if we assume that the rolling of these two dice happens independent of each other, then the probability of rolling a 6, well, the 1 is 1 over 6, and uh, it's independent, we just sort of multiply that. We have 1 over 6 times 1 over 6, it's 1 over 36. That is the probability of observing the outcome of 12. Now, what if the outcome would be 4. Is that more likely or less likely? It's more, more likely. It's more likely. How much more likely is it? Yeah, it is probability nine. of uh, 1 plus 2 yeah. plus probability of 2 plus 2. Yeah. 
Yeah. I guess that's it. And there we make it also 2 plus 1 because we yeah, count yeah. them as different events. There you go. This um, uh, uh, yeah, is uh, one, 1 plus 3, plus 2 plus yeah. 2, and 3 plus 1. Yeah, that's exactly right. right. And we can assign, as we did here, probabilities to these events. If we do that, we find now, okay, so that's like basically the sum of three such events, uh, all, all equally likely. So it's like uh, the chance of uh, rolling a 4 is three times higher than the chance of rolling a 12. Yeah, well, you know, whatever. Um, with these chance nodes introduced to our trees, we would again have to modify the min-max algorithm, but we can do that. Um, it is then called expected min-max, and I'm indicating that by a leading letter E here. And basically, apart from that leading letter E, nothing changes except for that if n is a chance node, we have to compute the probability of observing the outcome. Basically, what we compute is the expectation for observing uh, this outcome. But that is exactly this. This is all there is to it. We can use that immediately to uh, to deal with games that involve elements of chance. But I will basically gloss over that. It's not so interesting to us. Now, before we uh, finish today. What have we learned so far? How can we put that in a historical perspective? Now, we uh, spent quite some time talking about min-max searches for deterministic turn-based two-player zero-sum games of perfect information. And, uh, yeah, this dates back to 1928. How is John von Neumann actually wrote this article in uh, Annalen der Mathematik zur Theorie der Gesellschaftsspiele. Uh, this is this is and, and you could if you want to track it even further back in time But this this is the first time where it was like uh, deliberately Discussed in the context of, of games such as chess. So yeah, it goes back to uh, 1928 the idea of you know Thinking about infallible opponents and what to do in order to come up with strategies against those um, And and this min max was then discussed in much further detail by Wiener in his 1948 book. So min-max has a very venerable history. There's nothing new under the sun. Right? These things are 70 years, like 80 years old. This is, this is uh, very, very surprising if you think of it. That it took quite some time until it was developed far enough to beat the uh, world chess champion. Alpha-beta pruning is very interesting because it was <laughs> Uh, invented and discovered uh, independently, as they say, several times throughout history. Uh, first, first discussion was by McCarthy. Uh, Nivell and Simon in '58 actually call it alpha-beta pruning. Um, Knut and Moore uh, contributed some. I forgot how they call it, but it has been rediscovered numerous times. And then, sort of, Pearl finished it off by proving lots of things about it. For instance, like this. Uh, effort things I mentioned. If, you, if you're interested in that, then you could read this article. There are the mathematical proofs for what I put in quotation marks. Right. So, uh, surprisingly old technologies in both cases. Then, how does the state of the art in, say, chess playing make use of this technology? So, they all use min-max searches and they all use alpha-beta probably. Right? And they have uh, very sophisticated cutoff techniques. This idea of quiescence search basically says uh, that you should avoid uh, moving towards states where your payoffs begin flipping. Right? You could end up in, in some state where you will win, but then if the opponent, the opponent will win, then you will win. These are things you should not explore to the full depth. You should try to go for a state that will uh, not flip between the outcome for you and your opponent. Right? And there are things as uh, about um, what, what to do about uh, the decision for, for where to move in these cases. And I marked it in red because uh, all of the programs out there that play computer chess use highly tuned evaluation functions. Right? And they all depend on, on these transposition tables we discussed at the beginning of today's lecture. They all have these a databases of opening and endgame moves 
And they just sort of like once they read a state, reach a state that is in, in their lookup tables or in their databases, they stop computing, but look up what will happen from there. No computations anymore. And with all of this, they still require extreme computing power. And here is how much computing power they typically require. So Deep Blue, when uh, it won against Kasparov in 1907, evaluated 126 million states per second, on average. So this, this was a supercomputer, and it really did a lot of computation. Um, yeah, it, it generated about 30 million moves or positions per move, and that is to say, average look ahead was 14 levels down the tree. The evaluation function uh, was based on more than 8,000 features. And, and there's like, seriously, a lot of human ingenuity went into designing these evaluation functions. And the databases, like with the end games and opening positions, they had access to more than 700,000 recorded chess, chess matches. And looking at, at this, the obvious question is, now is this intelligence? Is that AI? What would you think? I will help you. This is, if you remember, in our second lecture, um, where we had this philosophical discussion what, as to what constitutes AI and what doesn't. We said, okay, there's like this idea of thinking humanly, rationally, acting humanly, acting rationally, uh, sort of. Uh, what, what of these ingredients are being covered by modern chess programs? Well, there is mathematical logic, uh, yeah. obviously. Well, I call it inference. Logic is this end and or. Pardon? There's inference, I would say. Inference, yeah, yeah. Inference is in there. Game theory. Game theory, Game theory yeah. You know, funnily enough, uh, the reason the reasoning is, is sort of the same as the inference there, right? This knowledge representation, if you think of it, it's encoded in these evaluation functions. And that's also learning. Where's the learning? Mm -hmm. okay. um, to learn for features, maybe. Yeah, but even simpler? Um, they're they're evaluating each state, right? So yeah. Where, where, where does this thing learn? Exactly. She said with the previously said state. So by building the lookup table, these programs learn. And it hurts me to say, but uh, according to, <laughs> to these criteria we sort of listed when we thought about what constitutes intelligence, then yeah, you know, these things are intelligent. Um, At least. I don't agree. Hmm? I, don't agree. But I mean, me neither. Don't worry. So he doesn't agree. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't as well. But with respect to these sort of buzzwords, we listed when we thought about what, what is it that makes intelligence, right? We find that several of them are well covered by these tree search algorithms with evaluation functions and uh, lookup tables. And this is, of course, the, the good thing is, the good thing is that these cognitive and neuroscientific aspects are not covered at all. Right, so this, this is, uh, if it is a form of intelligence, then definitely not the human or biological intelligence we know from everyday life. Yeah, but, but according to these sort of brutally rough criteria, we can actually say you know, like they are covered. They are covered. There is reasoning, there is inference, there is learning, there is knowledge representation. It's like based on concepts from game theory, like with these infallible opponents. Yeah. So, to sum everything up, we now know about transposition tables, this idea of you know, reusing what you have encountered um, previously. We have looked into pruning techniques, and in particular the idea of alpha beta pruning. There are other pruning algorithms, um, but our interest with this whole lecture series is not so much in, in playing chess, so we don't really have to look into these. Um, we have looked into depth restricted searches and evaluation functions and for those of you who have already had a look 
at the second project assignment, you see that I'm now asking you to come up with a program that plays Connect4 by expanding a search tree and um, you know to not have it run forever. A good idea would be to sort of restrict the depth of the exploration of the search tree and that is to think about an evaluation function. You have an idea as to that now. And ever so briefly, because it's really not of interest to us, we looked into how these things can be extended towards situations where there are elements of chance. That is basically the summary of today's lecture. Are there any questions? Yeah? Is there any techniques to find the good value for cutoff? His question is about uh, techniques to find good cutoff values, and um, I have to say I don't know. I don't know. Um, Typically, I can answer your question, all. I don't know, but typically uh, that is a trade-off. It's a trade-off of uh, how much time you're willing to spend on exploring. Right? And um, for instance, for chess, there's actually a time limit. Or under the um, uh, World Chess Tournament conditions, they have a time limit for making a move. And that was used in, in uh, Deep Blue. Right, they, they say, okay, so the time limit is, I don't know, have to be careful here, say three minutes, I don't really know, or 30 minutes, whatever. And within 30 minutes, we can compute so and so many things, and that equals looking ahead so and so deep. This is, this is one criterion for how to determine look aheads. Uh, other than that, um, I, am, I am not aware of, of any, any ideas there. But there must be, there must be. Use, use Google and you'll find stuff. I would surprise if there isn't anything. Any other questions? Okay, so this afternoon uh, you'll have to present your project results to me. So we see you again uh, at uh, 2 o'clock. Thank you.